Welcome back to This Week. Time now to get the views of our media and political experts, MMA Creative Vice President, Democratic Operative Mike Kopp, and Herb Daly on 1510 WLAC, syndicated talk show host Steve Gill. Welcome. You, Happy Thanksgiving, guys. Everybody have a good holiday. Yeah. Late this week, uh, Governor Haslam came out against tightening the open meetings law, the sunshine law as we know it. This is not going to endear him with some of the more conservative aspects of, of his party who were trying to go back to more closed doors for smaller groups. A little bit of a surprise that he did this? You know, I think that he's dealt with this as mayor of Knoxville. And, and that's what and he when said. when you look at the hurdles that are placed, particularly in trying to get non-controversial things done, you know, you've got council members that can't talk to each other. They can't go have lunch and try to figure out where their differences are and overcome them. So I think he was looking at it from a practical standpoint, not from a secrecy standpoint. And I think if you talk to most folks who've dealt in uh, state government or small municipal government with these issues, it does put a lot of barriers up. It doesn't necessarily prevent the kind of shenanigans from taking place. Well, I thought it was surprising because you remember when he came in as governor, even as a candidate, he was trying to you know close basically down in any any uh, access to his finances right. and personal finances to, so that you know voters and citizens could make a decision about conflict of interest. So I thought it was surprising. I thought it was a good move, but I thought it was surprising. Have we got a feel for him yet? He's a year into his first term. Is he a middle-of-the-road guy? Is, is he all-business guy? Is he a combination of these things? He had a very small agenda last year. It looks like he's going to have a small agenda again this year. I think he's definitely a, a business guy. I don't think he is an ideology kind of guy. I don't think he's driven by any kind of uh, ideology in the political arena. And he's not really a partisan guy either. Uh, so I think that really kind of puts you in where you're in no camp, which means you end up getting shot at by every <laughs> camp. And as Michael tell you, it's like, like they say about the middle-of-the-road politicians. The only thing in the middle of the road are possums being run over in that center line. And, <laughs> and that's the danger ways. of being in the right. middle. Yeah, exactly. I, I would agree with you 100%. I think... Just looking at it, I'm not sure what he's actually accomplished. I think some things have happened that, you know, the states continue to do its business. But I haven't really seen, and I think a lot of citizens are kind of wondering, when, when are we going to see the big agenda? When are we going to see the big push to create new jobs? I think it's just been a little tinkering here and there, trying to keep a middle-of-the-road position, and I'm not sure it, a whole lot's getting done. That's and we're anticipating, haven't seen it yet, but another small agenda from him, only like three issues last year. seems like it's going to be similar again this year. As you saw, I spoke with uh, Speaker Harwell, and she's talking about how, as we all anticipate, jobs, the economy going to be the number one issue for lawmakers. But with it being an election year next year, despite her push to keep the number of bills smaller, there's going to be a tendency for folks to want to get that hometown pressure, want to show folks at home what we're doing. Social issues, again, become top of the agenda. It's going to happen. Look, every one of these legislators has people calling and saying, why don't you do something about this? <laughs> and it's easy for them to drop a bill and say, hey, I tried. The problem is all that stuff takes time to then get through the process, get cleaned it's out. expensive. And right. it doesn't pass. And at right. the end of the day, each legislator can go back to their friend or their lobbyist and say, I tried. And they don't have any bad side. The problem is it just delays the process and kind of mucks up the works. The, the other friend in that process are the consultants that they're going to be hiring. <laughs> like yourself. Yeah, I, guess I, I mean, and, and basically what you're going to have, it's the silly season. You're going to have consultants and and, and pollsters telling these candidates what the people want to hear. And that's the kind of stuff that's going to create the agendas that you're going to see in the legislature. But there will be script. I, th I think part of the problem, though, is the media drives some of this. When somebody drops a bill that has no chance of getting anywhere, <laughs> if it's controversial, it's whether it's con Congress or whether it's here, people go into hysterics. They start sending emails out, have you heard about this? It's like, well, it's not going anywhere. I don't need to talk about it on my radio show because it's not even going to get out of committee. But people go into hysterics over the stuff that gets dropped sometimes. And, and frankly, sometimes the media helps that along. And one of those bills next year talking about the possibility of eliminating gun permits in Tennessee, although the lobbyist is also already saying that's probably not going to fly this year. But there is going to be some gun legislation to improve access for, for gun owners to get onto company properties in churches and schools. Those will be controversial. And those are serious. They want those to pass. Look, we've had UFO landing pads. <laughs> yes, we have. <laughs> We've had to pull up your pants, don't show your butt <laughs> legislation put in. You know, the kind of things, again, that dropped in the hopper doesn't necessarily mean that serious legislation is going to go anywhere, and it kind of works itself out. And those kind of firearm issues, the gun issues, they pull well, particularly in rural areas, and that's what these the legislators will be looking Let's at. Let's talk the GOP presidential primary. We saw Michelle Bachman. We saw Rick Perry. We saw uh, Newt Gingrich now climbing, all of them falling. Newt Gingrich says he's got more staying power. Does it look like it? He's gaining in the polls, in the, in the important polls, the primary polls. He's hanging in there. Romney's kind of settling a little bit. This has been a fascinating process already, and we're now going from the marathon into the sprint <laughs> in politics. In the the next important time. Days. 
Yeah, the, the funny thing I think about this is, is, and somebody pointed this out to me the other day, we have had the most debate-intensive Republican primary process in history. And Newt Gingrich told me six months ago that that's how he was going to end up in this position. It was going to be debate-intensive. He was going to do well in that. He was going to end up as sort of the last conservative standing as the alternative to Romney. If we had had this kind of debate-intensive process for the Democrats four years ago with Hillary Clinton, John Edwards, Bill Richardson, and Barack Obama, I think Hillary Clinton would have come out of that process. <laughs> you wouldn't have had the ability of charisma to carry you through if you were debating the issues in substance 112 times. So it has not been good for a Rick Perry, but it's been great for a, uh, a new king. Well, the problem that the, the ones that are left standing have is character and, and, and family values have, have filtered off a lot of these candidates. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to afford to, to run from it, and Gingrich has got a bullseye on him. Has this shown again that uh, Mitt Romney has this base he hasn't been able to grow the base. If anything, it may be deteriorating a little bit, and that's been his biggest problem. Look, we've talked in the past about sports and politics analogies. In sports, if you play to not win, you lose. <laughs> and Mitt Romney's been playing to not lose this whole process, and that's a good way to lose. He's been playing to not lose, and, and he's now put himself in a position where, where he's gone from a can't-lose position to a now it looks like he's going to have to really play hardball to get the primary nomination. I, I'm not so sure about that. I think Gingrich, is, again, has a bullseye on him because of some character flaws. He may be the last one standing, Romney. But we know the bulls out. We know the character flaws. They've been dealt with in the past. He was this powerful figure in the early 90s. We know about his issues, lobbying, his financial issues, women issues. We know all about this. It's going to be rehashed, but will it have the same impact it did the first time? I, guess? I don't think so because you've got a demarcation line. He has a new wife. He has embraced his faith. That gives you a pretty clear, bright line of who he was and who he is. Now, unless they have, you know, some dalliances with right. this wife, unless they have scandals <laughs> new material, this situation, then I, I don't think it has as big, big an issue. Look, America is the great country of mulligans and do-overs, and Newt Gingrich has to count on that. I would agree with that, but I, I, I don't know that we, we know everything about Gingrich, and I think uh, his past will probably creep in somewhat, and as you pointed out, who knows what we don't know. We know more about Newt, though, than we know about Barack Obama, and he's been president for three years now. <laughs> Steve Gill, Mike, I appreciate your time and your insights. Stay with us. This week continues in a moment.